professor who's offering extra credit if that's the case. If not, just your name is good enough. I'm going to scan this this evening and email it to all faculty so they know who attended. So our speaker is Dr. Jason Diaz, who has a PhD from UPenn and a bachelor's degree from Ithaca College. He has a number of publications, <coughs> lots of teaching experience, and his talk today is going to be on viruses, molecular ma machines that cause disease. So without further introduction, please welcome Dr. Jason Diaz. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you guys here today. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, my kind of path through science. I thought I would um, structure today's talk a little bit less as a um, only a research talk and a little bit more as kind of a career talk, talking about how, what got me into science, what had kind of uh, adjusted my path uh, career-wise, and how I ended up at Penn, both as a PhD student and then um, later as a postdoc. Uh, and I'm going to kind of focus my talk on the two big topics that have always been kind of fascinating to me, which is uh, which are viruses and then eventually molecular biology. Um, so before I jump into that, let me just briefly highlight what molecular biology is, because it really, once I understood what that field was, it, it, um, it really kind of captured what, what had interest me since um, I was basically in high school or even middle school. So um, as a molecular biologist, we're interested in the molecules that uh, make up the fundamental um, parts and units of life. And so for example, here I have um, the structure of the capsid of a virus. This is uh, SV40 polyomavirus. And the capsid functions as a protective coat to protect the viral DNA on the inside. What I hope you can appreciate is that the capsid is kind of like a soccer ball of all these repeating donut-shaped units here. Um, and those donut-shaped units that repeat uh, many, many times over the structure of the capsid are actually six copies of the same protein that arrange in their inner ring. Um, and so as a molecular biologist, we're really interested in what are the features of that particular protein that allow it to first form into the donut-shaped six-member ring, and then what allows those rings to then self-assemble into this larger complex structure. And, uh, Although I'm using a virus here as an example, as a molecular biologist, we're interested in all these interactions for all sorts of things that happen in the cells and outside of cells um, and in kind of bigger um, aspects of biology. So again, we're interested in what are the molecular properties of these proteins or other molecules that allow them to form these really incredible um, structures in the cell. Um, so um, I'm gonna go way, way back to how I got really into science in the first place. Um, which uh, I had some amazing science teachers in high school, and there was one particular, Barbara Russell, who was my chemistry teacher when I was a junior in high school. And um, there was something about chemistry that just really captured my attention. I loved kind of the simplicity and abstract um, thinking that was involved with it. But even as a high school student, I was able to appreciate uh, kind of some really incredible um, cycles and synergy that um, were present in biology. So I have here two. Um, very classic chemical equations that everyone learns in both probably chemistry and biology. Um, this first one is um, a very simplified um, chemical uh, summary of photosynthesis where um, plants and other photosynthesizing organisms can combine carbon dioxide and water using the energy derived from sunlight to make sugars. Um, and they release oxygen, which then um, uh, most living things will then use to then break down sugar to, gener uh, to generate both energy, which is stored in um, molecules called ATP or other mo similar molecules, and also release carbon dioxide and water. And what I think you can appreciate is that um, carbon dioxide and water is the output of respiration and the input of photosynthesis. And so we have this really incredible cyclical chemistry going on between all the different organisms um, uh, on the planet. And uh, I just thought that was really beautiful and fascinating. Um, chemistry can be fun. So uh, I really love thinking about chemical molecules like this um, and relating it to um, everyday life. So uh, this is actually the chemical structure of caffeine, which I think some of you here are enjoying right now. Um, and so uh, I was really fascinated in trying to understand how, you know, by looking at the chemical structure, how do we understand how caffeine works um, in our body to give us that kind of energy boost. Um, and uh, this is a uh, chemical structure of chlorophyll. So this is what makes plant leaves green and this is what's actually capturing the energy from sunlight in photosynthesis. 
And even if you don't understand all the chemistry that's going on here, I think you can, even the layperson can appreciate how beautiful the structure is with some symmetry here, with this really incredible ring, um, and this tail. And uh, as you start learning more about chemistry and understanding how this chemical structure is able to capture energy from sunlight, it just makes it even more fascinating. Um, and then I think this was also the first time I started to think about um, chemistry also in three dimensions. Um, and this was especially true in college, but it started a little bit in high school. So this is just the chemical structure of glucose, and you can appreciate that it's not, you know, we like to depict it as these flat things just because it's easier to draw, but really chemistry happens in three dimensions just like regular life, right? And so um, there are specific properties of that shape um, that allow that glucose to be used in particular ways and also prevents it from being used in particular ways. And so um, this was really why I started to be challenged to think about these very abstract processes as physical things that are happening in three-dimensional space. That will be a theme that happens again and again later when we go into molecular biology. Um, so, um, but I really started to, as I thought more about chemistry, I really became fascinated by its connection to biology because I had already learned this very abstract thing called oxidative phosphorylation. This is the end of the respiration of chemical reactions, so this second one here. Um, where um, we uh, are able to generate water break, uh, using oxygen, and there are a whole bunch of electrons moving around. You can appreciate this in the mitochondrion, which is uh, an organelle in the cell. Um, and there are all these different proteins in this membrane, that, and all, there's all sorts of crazy stuff happening here. And, uh, but this is basically what the cell is using to do what looks like a very simple chemical reaction. So, and why the heck is the cell doing, has, has all of these different components, just to do with uh, something that looks very simple um, chemi uh, chemically. And the reason for that is it wants to be very careful about how it's going to utilize the energy that's released in that reaction. And it really comes down to this really fascinating protein called ATP synthase. And um, it was when I finally got to see exactly how this protein works that I became really just fascinated with molecular biology. And to give you an idea of what I mean by exactly how this protein works, there is a really fun uh, video on YouTube. There's all sorts of fun videos on YouTube for molecular biology, by the way, so I encourage you to kind of check it out. Um, okay. And uh, so this ATP synthase protein is actually a turbine. So this is, this is just a, a, um, a representation of this protein as it's making ATP molecules, which you can see um, popping off um, in bright lights. And you can see there's an actual physical turbine that physically spins around um, and uh, you, uh, that spinning action, which is driven by um, some chemical properties, allows that protein to actually synthesize ATP. So I was really fascinated. No, we're not, we're not just, when, we, uh, when I'm looking at this structure, for example, these are not just static blobs. These are actual physical machines that are actually physically working to create more molecules that the cell is going to use. And I just found that really fascinating. Um, around this time in high school, um, I also um, was introduced to what has continued to be my very favorite, um, I guess, order of life, if you even want to call it life, uh, which are viruses. And so the classic image of virus that we got in high school are these really incredible bacteriophages. So these are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. And um, bacteriophages in particular look incredibly alien, right? So this is a, this is a virus, and it, you know, it looks very mechanical, right? Um, something that came from outer space almost. And it, you know, it just seeing a, a bacteria that's studded with all of these crazy um, viral particles just kind of like sent a chill down my spine. I wanted to learn more about um, how is you know this barely looks like a living thing. And people argue about whether we should consider viruses as living or non-living things, and that's a discussion that we can have later if it interests you. But um, the fact of the matter is, these viruses have existed for millions of years. They've co-evolved with bacteria to continually be able to infect them, and so they're definitely biological entities that we should be um, thinking about, and um, I just found them very, very fascinating. Um, so coming out of high school, I began to have the beginnings of a molecular view of biology. Um, I you know, started to wonder about things like DNA and proteins and lipids, which we kind of talk about abstractly and trying to wonder, but these are things that exist in three-dimensional space. They have physical properties and chemical properties. How are those properties used to kind of you know, make a functional living uh, organism. Um, and uh, going into high school, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to go to med school, and after high school, I decided I was really fascinated by this chemical view of life, and I thought maybe I'd be more interested in going into the pharmaceutical industry or some other type of uh, kind of health-related but chemical-based uh, field. And so um, I ended up going to Ithaca College uh, to pursue a degree in biochemistry since I felt that that degree had merged my two um, loves coming out of high school. 
and um, at Ithaca I had some really formative experiences both in and outside the classroom. So outside the classroom, I had a lot of experience um, doing actual research in a lab. So Ithaca College is a small liberal arts college. There are, no, there are very few graduate programs and absolutely no graduate programs in the science departments. And so all the research that goes on in those labs is run by both the faculty and undergraduate students. Um, and so I had um, the great honor and pleasure to work with uh, Marina Cayo, um, who was really interested in the genetics of taste. Um, and um, although it wasn't directly related to molecular biology, it was an awesome opportunity for me to kind of get in the lab and start doing science and thinking about experiments. Um, and her model organism for studying taste was this really fascinating um, insect called the P. aphid, um, which if anyone has gardens or keeps plants around, they're huge pests, right? They eat your, you know, your plants, and they're really annoying, but they actually have a really fascinating life cycle, which I won't go into. Um, and, uh, but she, the reason why she studied them um, in, from the realm of taste is that the same species of aphids will actually have separate populations that prefer one plant or another. So in upstate New York, where Ithaca College is, the aphids preferred one of two plants, um, either red clover plants or alfalfa plants. And um, this preference was um, so specialized that if you were to physically take an aphid which had specialized for a clover plant and put on alfalfa, it will not. It will stop eating, starve, and, and die. And so she was very interested in the genetics behind that. Um, and so I got to learn some very basic molecular biology techniques to kind of purify DNA and, um, and analyze sequences and kind of uh, start making uh, hypotheses about what was going on here. Um, and I had some other lab experiences too, but this one culminated in an honors thesis project my senior year, um, which was kind of my first like real in-depth um, jump into actually doing research. Um, Oh, actually, before I go into that, and then additionally, I had a lot of very formative um, experiences in the classroom. Um, and so my um, view of genetics was expanded. Um, and once again, I found viruses to be really fascinating and really cool window into some very interesting genetics questions. So some of these bacteriophages, which I've already kind of shown you, um, when we normally think of viruses, we think they infect a cell, they make billions of copies of themselves, and then they you know, burst out of the cell and come, go on to infect other. Cell, um, cells, and that's still generally true for viruses, but a lot of the life cycles can be a little more complicated. So this particular um, virus can actually go through a di secondary, di uh, different life cycle where um, its viral DNA actually gets inserted into the bacterial DNA and just kind of like waits it out and just kind of um, hides, it, hides its genetic material in the bacterial cell uh, until um, it determines that the bacterial cell is in the right condition, condition for making new variants, in which case it, um, it goes into its normal lytic um, life cycle. And so um, when I was confronted with this, I was really fascinated because it's not like in the cell you have some person telling things to do things, right? Everything that's happening in the cell is, is a result of molecules coming together and interacting in particular ways such that the output is one particular outcome or another. So how is this viral DNA able to quote unquote know to go into this particular life cycle? What are the molecular um, underpinnings of this decision that's being made? Um, and uh, as it turns out, in my molecular biology class, I started to learn these things. And in this particular example, what happens is uh, during uh, this particular uh, phase where the virus is hiding out, um, there's a particular protein interaction on the viral DNA that prevents RNA polymerase. This is an enzyme, a protein that makes messenger RNA from your DNA, which is then made into protein. Um, so it prevents RNA polymerase from accessing this area of the genome, so it only accesses the parts that are important for maintaining the virus in a silent state. Um, and um, there are certain molecular events that happen in the bacterial cell that interact with other viral proteins, which um, when enough of those interactions happen, cause the expression of this other protein, which can bind a different region of the viral DNA where RNA polymerase would normally bind. And this causes RNA polymerase to switch its preference to this part of the DNA, and then this part activates um, the um, lytic version of the life cycle. So um, my point here is, uh, and what I found really fascinating was that the decision ultimately culminates in differences in um, DNA binding of very important um, proteins. Um, so that the decision which happens from all these sorts of protein interactions happening in the cell ultimately culminate in um, interactions on the DNA level um, to determine which genes are turned on and off. I really found the idea of these proteins interacting with DNA and this being the control of turning genes on and off really fascinating. And molecular biology, we also got a little bit more um, uh, uh, 
complex view of um, proteins and DNA interactions. And so um, this, for example, is um, the helicase complex. So this protein complex, which as you can see, makes kind of like a pinwheel um, shape, um, will actually circle DNA. So this little thing in the middle is a strand of DNA going through the pinwheel. And this pinwheel will actually spin and, un and open up your DNA so that it can be copied during DNA replication. Uh, and this pinwheel is actually made from six identical copies of the same protein, which are just colored slightly differently, so you can see the different uh, copies of them. Um, and uh, this is a particular view called a, a ribbon diagram, where we have start to understand the protein, uh, how the protein is folded um, when it uh, makes its final shape, and how those folds kind of interact with each other to make a larger complex. And there's a different view called space filling view, where you kind of see a better idea of what that probably actually looks like in three-dimensional space. These are six different versions from six different species of organisms of DNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that actually physically copies your DNA after helicases open them up. Um, and so I'm just showing you these pictures just to kind of give you an idea of kind of what I was starting to be confronted in, uh, in college of how we think about molecules um, in our cells doing important things like DNA replication, which is important not just for our own cells, but also uh, for um, viruses as well. Um, I also had a lot of teaching experience at Ithaca, um, so much so that I um, realized I really have a huge passion for teaching and tutoring and, and stuff like that. So I decided I want to pursue a career after all these experiences in uh, teaching at the college level. And so since that requires a PhD, I said, okay, I'm going to go to grad school then. Um, and so I ended up applying for four different uh, uh, grad school um, programs. I was really interested in viruses and molecular biology especially, so I was looking for programs that were strong in both of those. Um, and uh, in the end, I chose the University of Pennsylvania, um, where I started in 2009 and then finished at the end of 2014. Uh, and I specifically applied to their uh, biomedical graduate studies program with a focus on molecular, um, sorry, cell molecular biology. And so um, in your PhD program, this is very common for um, the biomedical sciences and many other programs. You first spend your first year going through three different labs to kind of figure out what lab will be the best fit for you for, uh, for your dissertation work. Um, and so I, these are just the three different uh, faculty members that I did my uh, research with, and they all had um, kind of common themes with their research in that they're all interested in this question of how viruses can silence themselves to hide and then reactivate during certain situations to actually make new viruses. Um, and that's usually what causes disease. And so um, I, uh, with Dr. Nigel Frazier, I studied herpes simplex virus, um, DNA virus, um, which is very, very commonly infected. Um, and then I also uh, studied with Uno Doherty, who studies uh, HIV, which I was very interested in studying. Uh, and my final rotation was Dr. Jiang Shin Yu to study human papilloma virus. Um, and uh, what was interesting is, um, so I went into college thinking I wanted to go into pharmaceutical industry as a you know biochemistry person. I finished college thinking, no, I actually want to teach. I think that's really awesome. I'm really excited about that. Um, and when I thought about my research interests, I was like, I really want to study HIV. I think HIV is really fascinating. It's really important uh, global health thing. And um, while I really care about you know cancer research, it just the intellectually didn't uh, stimulate stimulate me as much. And so when I started grad school, I thought for sure it was going to end up in an HIV lab. But as it turns out, once I started to kind of get exposed to the current science and what's going on, everything that I loved about viruses, all that molecular biology about how these proteins work to infect the cell and manipulate the cell had already been very well characterized in HIV. All the questions in the HIV field were now um, in areas that didn't interest me as much. But in the human papillomavirus fields, there are actually still lots of really interesting questions that I found very fascinating. Um, with regards to how viruses uh, manipulate their, um, the host cell using these protein-protein interactions. Um, so I ended up actually um, going to Jiangshan Yu's lab and um, had a great experience studying two very similar um, DNA viruses. And so when I started in her lab, I started working on human papillomavirus. So HPVs are the causative agent of all forms of skin wars. Um, and they're really incredible because they are uniquely adapted to mammalian skin. They don't really infect any other type of organism. Um, and so there are HPVs that infect rabbits and cows and chipmunks and all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, they're a very simple virus, even by viral standards. So we usually think of viruses as a very simple form of life, and these are even simple versions of that. 
Um, and they exist primarily as a DNA copy of their genome, which we like to schematize as their different genes over here, color-coded as various things. Um, and this DNA, um, this uh, circular piece of DNA is protected by this protein capsid. You saw a similar version of this earlier. Uh, and again, you can kind of see how this capsid is, you know, uh, a soccer ball, basically, of these different smaller circular donut structures, which themselves are, again, six copies of a similar protein. You can see similar numbers coming up again and again and again in biology, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and what's really fascinating about their life cycle is, again, we normally think of viruses as infecting a cell and then making up bajillion copies and then bursting out of the cell to infect new things. And that's not quite how HPV works. Um, I mentioned previously that I was interested in viral latency or the idea that viruses can kind of hide out and um, hide out in their host cell for a bit. And so the way that HPV does this is it actually really tightly controls when each set of genes, which are color coded green, red, green, and yellow, are turned on. And the, way, the reason why it does this is it infects skin cells. So skin cells are very interesting. Um, new skin cells are produced at the very, very bottom of your skin layer. And those new cells will eventually be pushed up and up and up as more cells divide down here. As the cells leave the bottom layer, they start to differentiate, meaning they go from a kind of naive, like juvenile state, to start making the proteins required to make functional skin that forms the protective barrier of all of our bodies. Um, and so they produce things like keratin, which is a protein you probably have heard of, and oils and other sorts of things to protect us from the outside. Um, and so those fully differentiated, fully mature skin cells are on the, on the top here, and the have immature cells are down here. And so what the virus has done is it's kind of coded each of its genes in such a way that each set will be turned on at different stages of its host cell actually um, developing. So that new viruses, which are produced once you start making these capsids, are made from these yellow genes over here, they're only produced at the very, very top of the skin. Your immune system has a very hard time um, surveilling this area of your skin because by design that part of your skin is designed to slowly slough off in you know small layers um, so that when you have like abrasions or like you scrape your skin whatever it can very easily come off. So your immune system has a hard time um, seeing this part and has spends more time kind of viewing this part of your skin and so the virus is kind of clever and has evolved in such a way that viral particles really are only produced when the skin cells ready to fall off anyway. So I was really fascinated by this. Um, so the other reason why people, are, so people aren't interested in uh, HPV is just because they cause warts, because warts are, while gross, not usually a huge health problem. The really huge health problem with them, which is kind of um, related to the idea of a wart, is that they're also important uh, for a couple of very important cancers. So um, I think it's 99% of all cervical cancers are caused by an HPV infection. Um, and uh, many, uh, and now people are appreciating that all, uh, upwards of 30% or more of head and neck cancers are actually caused by eight persistent HPV infections. Um, and if you think about it, a wart is basically a localized area where there's a lot of extra um, cells being made, and that's basically what cancer is. And so as it turns out, these red genes here, their function is to cause the cell to rapidly divide, 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 divide more than it normally um, divide. And so um, in these cancers, what happens is these proteins kind of go out of control. Um, and I was really interested in this phenomenon with these cancers where the virus normally has its DNA as a circle, um, and it likes to keep it that way. Uh, but in all these, in almost all these cancers, what would happen is the viral DNA would be found inside the host DNA. And that's something that normally does not happen with the viral life cycle. And so people were really curious, how, how and why is this viral DNA getting inserted into the um, host DNA just like HIV would, for example. Although HIV does that on purpose and for very specific reasons, HPV doesn't. But it's, this event seemed to be very important for cancer. So I spent um, about two years working on this, one year after I joined the lab and another year after I finished my qualifying exams. But unfortunately, studying integration was very, very hard because it's a very, very rare event. And eventually, my uh, advisor, Jian Shin Yu, and I decided that that project was uh, not really going anywhere. I, and I shouldn't spend too much time working on a project um, that wasn't going to produce something so that I can actually have a thesis project and, and um, actually produce results. And so uh, I decided to switch to a completely new virus, um, which we had just started studying the lab. And this virus is very fascinating. So um, and one of the reasons why I think it's really fascinating is it's an example of being able to find new viruses thanks to new sequencing technology. Um, and so there's this very, very rare skin cancer called um, Merkel cell carcinoma, and it's called that because it's a carcinoma, a cancer of Merkel cells, which are these really, really weird cells in your 
skin, um, which in this particular diagram of your skin are these red spiny things um, at the interface of the dermal skin layer, and these are neurons in yellow. And uh, so they're a very, very rare population of these very strange cells, which kind of have properties of both neurons and skin cells, and there's this very rare cancer of these particular cells. And as it turns out, people have been trying to figure out what the cause of this cancer was for various reasons. They thought that it might have been an infectious agent, and using these really incredible sequencing technologies to sequence the, gene, the entire DNA and the mRNA, in this case of these tumors, they were able to identify a new virus that had never been discovered before, seen before, um, which was a polyoma virus. Um, which you can see eventually um, we were able to identify these polyomaviruses. This is an electron micrograph. And again, you can see this very similar viral structure of this soccer ball. And even, I hope in the back you can even tell that these soccer balls are made up of smaller little spheres, which again are those tabs and proteins. Um, so, uh, right. Um, so no one had um, discovered this particular virus before, but people knew about polyomaviruses. In fact, polyomaviruses used to be grouped with papillomaviruses, or HPVs, uh, because they have very similar life cycles. Um, and that very, very first capsule structure I showed you of SV40, that's the prototypical polyomavirus that everyone studies when you're a virologist. Um, and so um, one of the proteins that people knew about um, that was very important for polyomavirus um, infection in which they knew was important for causing cancer was a protein called large T engine. So now I'm going to kind of start transitioning to what I actually did for my PhD work. So I decided to um, zoom in on, uh, oh I'm sorry, let me back up. So the reason why our lab was studying um, tuberculosis cell polyomavirus, or MCV as I will call it, is because it's so similar to HPVs that the two fields have a lot of talk with each other. We can go to the same meetings and we kind of compare notes on how these viruses function. And because they're so similar, and uh, so many people have been asking my advisor, you know, have you guys thought about you taking your research into some Merkel cell polyomavirus since it had just been recently discovered? I also didn't highlight that this discovery happened in 2008. I started working on this virus in 2011, so we only had known about it for three years at that point. Um, and, uh, and so I decided, to, I told my advisor, okay, the HPV project isn't going anywhere. However, there's this new virus that no one knows anything about, or we know some things about it, but there's a lot of things that we don't know about, so there's a lot more uh, opportunity for me to kind of uh, claim this area of research as my own and kind of make some um, seminal discoveries for this newly discovered virus, which I thought was very exciting, but was also very challenging because when it's something that no one has worked on before, you get a lot of cool like um, brownie points for being the first one to discover something, but you have to actually discover it and no one has worked on it before, so you have to try to figure things out um, that uh, you can sometimes take for granted for other systems where people have already spent a lot of time figuring out how to do particular techniques or, or, or things like that. So I decided to study uh, of this particular virus a protein called large tumor antigen. So in molecular biology, we like to take our protein and make a uh, and look at it in this linear fashion to kind of look at how the protein is um, designed, so to speak, or how it's evolved, basically. Um, because proteins usually have these functional units um, which, um, after the protein is expressed, will actually allow it to have the chemical and physical properties required to interact with other things in the cell. Um, and so this particular diagram just highlights um, in a linear fashion this protein, and um, you don't have to worry about all the details, I'm not going to go into all the details because I don't want to bore you, but the big picture here is that there are two major functions that this protein does. Um, the first half, this tumor suppressor targeting, so tumor suppressors are proteins in your cell which will um, in general, they function to prevent the cell from dividing too much. Um, they're called tumor suppressors because when they're expressed, you have less incidence of cancer. When they're mutated, you have more incidence of cancer. Um, and so this particular area of large T antigen combines to lots of uh, different types of proteins in your cell, and that binding activity actually causes the cell to start dividing a lot, a lot, a lot. And you can imagine the virus would want that because it wants to make lots of copies of itself. And it does that if the cell is already copying. It's going to copy everything in the cell, including the virus. And so the second half of this protein is important for um, uh, the actual DNA replication part. So there's a DNA virus. It requires um, a helicase to unwind and open its DNA for replication. So the virus has its own. And these two, you would think, different functions, uh, very, very different functions. And human papillomavirus, these are two different proteins. They've been made into one protein for um, MCV. So that's really cool. This virus has decided to be very efficient and put all of its tools into one, um, into one toolkit, which is large T antigen. 
But at the same time, you then need this tool, you need to somehow know when to use this tool for, for each particular purpose. For example, at some point you want to do this activity where you cause the cell to divide. At a different point, you want to then start replicating your DNA. How do you decide how you're going to use the tool? Again, there's, no, there's not like a person inside the cell using large T in a particular way. The protein just kind of exists and it has to kind of on its own do its particular activities in a very organized fashion. Um, well, as it turns out, one way that um, biology has uh, kind of evolved to control protein expression is this chemical modification called phosphorylation, where I'm um, using ATP generated from respiration, which I kind of showed you earlier. You can add what's called a phosphate group, which is just a particular chemical um, structure to the protein. And this particular phosphate group can do lots of things. Because it's negatively charged, it can affect the way the protein is folded or the way it behaves. Um, it can also, it can affect the way other proteins recognize that protein. Um, and so this is a very, and the other nice thing about this is that it's very easily put on and off. And so there are proteins called kinases, which add phosphate groups, and proteins called phosphatases, which take off phosphate groups. And so there's a really cool system that biology has evolved to kind of very quickly modify a tool, basically, or modify a protein to change its function in some way, and then in a reversible fashion. Um, and so we knew from other polyomaviruses that large T, oops, that large T antigen uh, was phosphorylated, but we didn't know anything about the MCV version of large T. So um, to skip some very uh, uh, hard protein purification, what I did was I did a technique called mass spectrometry, and by saying I did it, I didn't actually do it. I purified the protein and gave it to someone who actually knew how to do mass spectrometry. And it is a technique for um, uh, basically identifying the chemical um, makeup of a particular molecule. Um, and uh, usually it's for very, very small molecules like glucose or like an amino acid. But proteins are huge, but we can do that for proteins because they're made of very discrete molecules called amino acids and we know a lot about their chemistry. We're able to then kind of break them down, analyze them on this really fancy machine, and then put that um, data together to get a sense of what the protein looks like. Um, this is what I'm showing you here is um, a protein alignment. So I'm taking the same large T protein um, depicted as its individual amino acids from different versions of um, <coughs> uh, polyomaviruses with MC on the top and lots of other versions of polyomaviruses on the bottom. The parts in the blue are parts of the protein which are the same no matter what species of virus you have. So you can imagine these are really important things for the protein because mm -hmm. evolution has not changed those parts. Um, and then everything, and everything in dashes are things that are, are missing. So you can see the MCV actually has a lot of these amino acids here in its protein sequence, which don't exist in most other MC or in most other large Ts. Uh, but more importantly, for the mass spectrometry, we we're able to then I did detect what parts of these protein are phosphorylated, which I kind of highlighted in these this, these three red asterisks. So I didn't mention back here. Phosphorylation usually happens when you have a free um, hydroxyl group or an OH group. And that's commonly serine, however, it can also be threonine or tyrosine, because these are two other amino acids which have OH groups or hydroxyl groups. As it turns out, the three sites were di three different threonines, and these numbers are just the amino acid position of where those threonines are. And just looking, so this was really cool. Okay, the protein's phosphorylated, and we're really sure that it's the three, these three different amino acids. What does that mean, though? Well, this particular first one was kind of interesting because it's in a region of the protein that doesn't exist in other versions of that protein. Um, the short answer to your immediate question is that I still don't know what that does, um, although I was, that was what I was most excited about, but I, there was no interesting things that happened when I tried to study that. This other one, which is in this very, very blue threonine, so that threonine apparently is very important because it, it's in every single copy of large T uh, for these different uh, versions of polyomaviruses. And as it turns out, people already knew what that threonine does. Apparently, phosphorylation of that threonine is important for activating the helicase portion of that protein so that it can do DNA replication. So, okay, we already have a hint, so we know what this threonine probably does. It has something to do with DNA replication. This other threonine, however, is not conserved, so it's new to MCV, and um, it's not very clear what it would do. So, I didn't really know, so at this point, we don't really know what's happening, except that we think that maybe this particular threonine phosphorylation is important for replication. So, I decided to then start studying replication just to confirm first that this phosphorylation event is, in fact, important for DNA replication. Replication was also a good thing for me to study because another postdoc in the lab had already started doing the studies and developed the techniques for studying replication in, um, in MCV infection. So I was able to kind of learn from him how to do these techniques and do them myself. Um, so I'm going to kind of, without going into a lot of the detail of the actual experiments, just kind of give you a look at what the experiments look like. 
Um, so things that I did was, um, one thing you can do is, since I knew where these threonines were, you can actually mutagenize them. You can change the sequence to become some other amino acid. So what I did is I changed them to an amino acid called alanine, which doesn't have any chemical groups on it. Well, it has a methyl group, but it's, it doesn't really do anything interesting chemistry-wise and can no longer be phosphorylated. And so this is a very common theme when you do science, is if you want to know how something works, break it and see what went wrong. And then that will give you some idea of what it's supposed to do and what actually works correctly. So um, this just gives you a view of what some of these assays look like. So these are different nuclei, um, which are seen in blue, which is a little bit hard to see if the light's on. Um, but in green, um, these are this is a fluorescence tag, um, so I can see the protein with a fluorescent scope. In green, this is our large T protein, and I have four different versions of the MCB large T. WT stands for wild types, so this is the natural one that exists in nature, and three different mutations um, at three different sites. Um, so the three different threonines that I discovered were phosphorylated, I've individually mutated them to alanine so they no longer function. So what we can already readily appreciate is that most of these large T's form these really large clusters and nuclei, and we know that these are called replication factories. This is where the virus is actually making its DNA copies. But this particular protein doesn't seem to do that. It's kind of like it's all over the nucleus. Um, and that makes sense because we know that this phosphorylation event, when it happens, is required for replication. So if you kill it, it can no longer replicate and no longer makes replication factory. So this is what we expected. But what's interesting from here is when I counted how many nuclei had these replication factories, clearly this mutation, there's no replication happening, so, which is what we expected. But what was unclear from just looking at a single cell, but was more clear once I started to look at more and more cells, was that this particular large T was more prone to making replication factories, meaning that maybe it actually replicates better than, wild type, than the normal version of large T. So to look at that in a different way, we did a technique called Southern Blot, which is a way of just detecting DNA. And um, so the technique is just to detect DNA, but the experiment is to allow the virus to replicate its DNA and then probe for that DNA using this blotting technique. Um, and so, for example, what you're seeing here, this is, uh, this is the actual um, DNA of the virus um, genome um, that's harvested from cells after infection. Um, and you can see that these two uh, different types of large sheep produce the same amount of DNA. Um, however, this particular protein has even more DNA than the normal version, meaning that in these particular cells you had more replication going on. Um, and uh, th then the rest of this is just controls to show you that the amount of protein and the, the amount of viral protein was about the same in these different um, uh, cells or actually in the case where there's a little bit less of the large T, there's still more replication. So it's very clear that even with a little bit less of this protein, we get a lot of replication, which is very interesting. So we're trying to understand what's going on. Why is this protein replicating more um, when we remove that phosphorylation site? So we did some modeling, which as a molecular biologist we do all the time. And so this particular model is of DNA. This is one region of that large T protein. This is the region that actually binds the DNA um, so that it can then unwind it as a helicase. Um, and this asterisk is just to help orient you. This asterisk here is the same position all three of these frames. And the key important thing I want to show you is where these threonines are. So um, threonine 299 um, is over here and it kind of faces, it's this red little, it's kind of hard to see this red little like um, Y shape that's facing away from the asterisk, which is where the DNA binding happens. Um, however, threonine 297 actually faces in the same direction as the DNA binding um, interface. And what's important is that DNA is actually very negatively charged. It has a phosphate background or backbone. And in chemistry, we know that negative charges repel each other, positive charges repel each other, but positive and negatives interact with each other, right? So if you imagine that a phosphorylation that happened here, I already told you that phosphate group is negatively charged it's going to be facing the phosphate background or backbone, which is going to create a negative-negative interaction. So the reason why we thought was um, the, this particular mutant was able to replicate more is we're getting rid of this 3D, which means that this protein can bind easier to this DNA. If we kept that 3D there and it got phosphorylated, it would no longer be able to bind. And so to test that, there's actually a DNA binding, a oh, I'm going to skip that, a DNA binding assay um, this is just a schematic to show you this is the DNA sequence of the virus. This is the sequence I used for my probe. It's tagged with a radioactive nucleotide so that I can see it um, using um, a particular machine. And so the DNA, when it's unbound, is going to run down here in the gel. And the DNA, when it's bound with large, is going to bind up here. And the take home message here is that with increasing amounts of normal large T, we see that this probe is 
more and more bound by large T. So the more large T I have, the more the probe kind of gets slower in the gel. However, the DNA, when it's bound by even a small amount of this particular mutant, it's bound very, very highly, indicating that messing up this phosphorylation really affects DNA binding. Um, which, um, uh, which basically, um, uh, prove, or I want to say prove, but basically agreed with our hypothesis that the chemistry that's going on here is a um, charge interaction between the threonine of 297 and the DNA backbone. Um, and so after all those studies, I was able to uh, say that um, the threonine 299 does actually function just like all the other versions of that threonine and other polymorphous large T's. But I was able to discover a new threonine phosphorylation that didn't exist in any other version of large T, and this is important for replication. Um, I was unable to discover anything about that particular threonine, which is fine, but what was uh, interesting is that um, you can imagine uh, this, going back to the big question of how do you get a protein to do so many different functions and still have a, 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 a correct infection cycle. Well, this threonine at 299 turns, oops, uh, turns on replication. So when this first phosphorylation happens, this part of the protein gets activated, this part gets um, kind of inactivated or less important. But eventually we need to stop making copies of DNA and start focusing on causing the cell to divide a lot. So the way we do that is we do this other phosphorylation which has the opposite effect. It put the brakes on the replication and increase these type of binding activities. Um, and so after many, many years of work, uh, I was able to come to that very, very simple conclusion. Um, and then for those of you interested in grad school, um, grad school is really fun but also really hard. So, um, so these are some of the, just so that it doesn't look like I just like breezed through. Um, it was actually very, very difficult. Um, there are lots of challenges that happen. Um, experiments will fail for oftentimes reasons that you don't understand, and so you'll spend a lot of time trying to troubleshoot and understand what went wrong. Um, even though science progresses at its own pace, Mother Nature has her own idea of how long it takes to do things. Um, there are real world deadlines for things like um, committee meetings or getting things ready for publication, which kind of can put stress on your research because they're putting a timeline on your research that may not be reasonable. Um, I already mentioned that working with a new virus was challenging because it, uh, you know, no one had worked on it before, so I had to come up with everything on my own. Um, and you know, there are some things which I just wasn't really good at. So all those techniques require purifying protein out of cells at a very, very high level and very, very pure fashion. And no matter how much I tried, I just could, would, never got really good at it, and that really hurt uh, my ability to do experiments um, afterwards. And so I really need a lot of help to kind of deal with that. Um, and I also realized after I went through grad school that I really love teaching. I, that never changed. That's still true. And I really enjoy research, but I realized afterwards that my passion really is for teaching and not necessarily for research. And that helped me stay focused on my career goal as a teacher after I finished my postdoc. So I was like, I don't want to do just research all, you know, one, uh, not 100% of the time after I finish my PhD. I really do want to teach. And I think I'd be better um, doing that than just staying in research. So and that was a very, very important um, thing to realize after grad school. Um, and then the last thing I just want to kind of take home, this is not meant to kind of pat myself on the back, but more to show you that research is a team effort. Um, so these are just a, some publications that I um, was one of the authors on from our lab. And I, the, what I want to kind of highlight is that you can see the same names over and over again. And that's because everyone in our lab helps each other. We all are good at different things and not as good at other things. And so we really help each other for our projects to kind of get these things going. And so this was my project, totally my own, and all these other projects were things that I was interested in. A lot of these are other Merkel cell polyomavirus large T projects, but they weren't necessarily my own, but I was fascinated by those projects and wanted to help out. And so science really is a team effort. Um, and so with that, these are just a snapshot of people that helped me for my graduate work. There are so many more in college and high school I didn't um, highlight, but um, again, it's a highlight that a lot of people kind of help you on your journey. Um, oh, and then with that, I will stop, and we have like five minutes for questions, so thank you. Are there any questions? Go ahead. It's kind of hard to find a job. I have a friend um, who is a professor at Rowland University, mm -hmm. and he was teaching the Rowland University Lab, and he was overqualified for education-wise, but underqualified for experience to get a job. Oh, so, so before I even go into teaching, um, I have to do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship where you spend a couple more years kind of honing your research. So I haven't really been on the job market yet, and I'm still in my postdoctoral fellowship, which is actually a teaching-focused one. And, but this is a problem in the education field in general, where um, there are very few professorship jobs, regardless of whether it's gonna be teaching-focused or research-focused. 
and they all kind of want you to be able to do everything to some extent. Um, and, if, and so that job market is very difficult. Um, and then in, outside of that, the next answer usually is industry, which again, those are going to be kind of very specific. Um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to say because it's, it, I, I really don't know what the answer is for that only because, because it takes so long to get your PhD by the time that you finish the job market might be slightly different but it is I think a, a particular problem right now and it's something I think about when I think about like mentoring you guys is that do I want to encourage you to get a PhD? Well I think getting a PhD is a very incredible experience, you learn a lot but I also know that the job market afterward is very tough so I don't really know what the correct answer is there. Um, so yeah, it's really hard. Um, I think a lot of people also don't realize that you can get a lot of, there are a lot of really good jobs to get just even at the master's level. And um, so I think it's really important to, and those are also very intense um, science jobs that are really, really rewarding. So I think it's important to have conversations with yourself and with other people about what you think your overall career aspirations are to have so you get the correct training for that. But I think it really kind of depends on you individual. Any uh, other questions? Question. Yeah. Um, so I know there's like an argument of whether or not viruses are like, well, alive. Or, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things was that like they're not they don't have cells, and right. that's one of the factors yeah. that distinguishes life. Um, so that protein capsid layer yeah. would that be sort of equivalent to like a nuclear envelope? It's um, that's a Interesting well, idea. Uh, yeah, that's a cool idea. So and it's not quite equivalent because uh, envelope, the envelope is actually made of a molecule called lipids. These are yeah, fatty yeah, things. That's the, um, um, and uh, but similarly, you can, yeah, the nucleus kind of protects the DNA and kind of compartmentalizes, so you can do DNA specific things in that area. Um, and that's similar to kind of what the capsule does in that it protects the virus. It's it's not quite equivalent because the size yeah, is course. way different. So like a viral particle, like if the nucleus was like this big, like a viral particle uh -huh. is probably like yeah, that big. Yeah, you can see the virus is on the outside of the bacteria. Sure, sure, yeah. 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 Right, right, exactly. But that, it is an interesting idea. So, because you do want, because in both cases, yeah, you want to protect your DNA from the outside. But the evolution of those are just very different. Okay. Um, yeah. Any uh, final questions? She has a question yeah. back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, when like the helix is regulated, what's the importance of understanding like what it does? Sure. So, um, so there are a couple. Of, so my particular research was what I would call basic science. So I just want to understand how the virus works for the sake of understanding how the virus works. Because oftentimes um, you need to know a lot about the virus and how it works in its normal infection cycle to then be able to pinpoint oh. During infection, I can disrupt this activity of the virus, and that will help us, um, you know, limit infection. Um, or I'll be able to look for infected cells because they have this particular protein in them. Um, so, in my particular research, the helicase itself is not super important for what for the health outcome because that particular function is really just for copying the DNA. However, um, this other part of the large C protein, this part, this is super important for cancer because this is what actually drives cancer. And what's interesting that in these cancer cells, this large T gets mutated almost all the time, so that the large T that's expressed no longer has any of this stuff. It only has the cancer-causing left half of the protein. So that's kind of interesting to us because we want to understand why in cancer, in this particular cancer, why do those cancers always delete out this, this half? That means that there's something happening with this half of the protein that's preventing cancer from happening. And that was also, that's actually the subject of this paper. Um, and as it turns out, there's some activity which we don't understand that happens from this helicase portion of the virus, which actually prevents cells from dividing too much, and that actually is anti-cancer almost. And so we're trying to understand what, what's going on there. Um, I don't know, I can't speak for Dr. Diaz, whether he can stay and answer more questions, but I've got to leave. Yeah, you have to go, so that's fine. So uh, thank you all. Um, I'll still be here for like another five, 10 minutes. If you have more questions, feel free to come up here and we can have more conversation.